What's up audit fans? Today we're going to get into a topic that has been requested quite a lot, which is auditing leases. And today we're going to look from the lessee's perspective, not the lessor's perspective. IFRS 16 resulted in a lot of changes with leases and that came in in 2019 and that saw billions of dollars of previously unrecognized leased assets now coming onto the balance sheet as well as lease liabilities. So there's certainly lots of complexity in valuing those leases and making sure that they're appropriately recorded. So today we're going to get into the auditing part of leases. I'm not going to go into the accounting technical aspects of it. There's certainly lots of videos uh, on YouTube that can help you with the accounting perspective, but today we're going to look into the auditing perspective. So let's get into it. What's up audit fans? Welcome back to Amanda Loves to Audit for my regular subscribers. Hi, if you're new, my name is Amanda. I do love audit and I teach audit at um, an Australian university to undergrads. So today we're looking at leases and I'm not going to do the accounting treatment of leases. You can look at any IFRA 16 video on YouTube. I'll link some in the description that are really, I found good in terms of helping my students understand leases. Today we're gonna to look at the audit perspective, but we also need to think about the process. So remember ASA, ISA 315 says we need to understand the processes. And this is really critical because if a company has automated processes or manual processes, once we've identified those processes, then we can test the internal controls. So when it comes to auditing leases, you know, we first need to start to look at the process. So let's go through what that process is. Normally there's got to be some sort of process to request a leased asset. Uh, you just can't lease one in a company yourself. So there's going to need to be some sort of approval of that request. Um, there's probably going to be a process to get quotes from different companies who supply the leased asset to help you out there. Once you've got a quote, then there's probably going to be some form of contract. Now it's really important here that the contract is reviewed by someone, uh, probably someone from a legal perspective to make sure that there has been that legal review. Then the parties to the contract need to sign the contract, and then we need to handle the accounting processes. All right, so we need to record the event in accounting. Now, from the accounting perspective, I guess there's a couple of different things that we do need to consider when we're looking uh, at the accounting process. Number one, there needs to be a process to add the asset potentially to the fixed asset register, to the FAR, fixed asset register. Um, and hopefully, you know, most fixed asset re registers these days have the ability to recognize an asset that you own versus an asset that you lease. So you need to make sure that there's that component there. So you need to add the asset to the fixed asset register. You're gonna need to make sure that you create the liability. LL is the lease liability there. Um, and then also there's gonna need to be a process for your regular journal entries. And those regular journals are going to be about the payments, because remember you have to make payments for your lease, uh, and also recording depreciation, because it is a leased asset um, and has its own liabilities. So in terms of testing the internal controls here, this is where it becomes really important to make sure that you understand what are the controls in place? What are the processes in place? So that then you can test those controls. So ISA, ASA 315 is really critical here in understanding the client. So here, what becomes really important now is deciding what is going to be the audit strategy. So if this is a company that has lots of leased assets and there are lots of new leases coming and going and you probably couldn't audit all of them, just like with bank loans, it probably makes sense to uh, test the internal controls and then do some substantive testing. If the company has like five leased assets and they didn't add any new leases this year, then you wouldn't even bother really testing internal controls. You just go straight to the substantive evidence. But you know, you need to look at the volume of the transactions, the value of them to decide whether you're going to go with that test a control strategy or the substantive strategy or a mix of both. 
Now for most publicly listed companies, uh, large companies, companies that need a big audit, you're going to probably look at both of those aspects, do a mix of those tests of controls and substantive tests. So in terms of substantive tests here, we need to look at the process. What is your client process under ISA, ASA 315, so that we can identify the controls. So, you know, we're gonna do things like uh, look at the approval process. So it could be things like um, select a sample of uh, leased assets and check there, whoops, that's not how I spell that type of there. There was a reviewed, or I should say is, was is a reviewed contract that was signed. All right, you wanna make sure that the contract was signed, so you've got a binding agreement there. Um, and that it was reviewed. Because remember the reviewing helps make sure that it's legally, you know, everything is okay for the client. So it's as simple as selecting that document, inspecting the document and making sure everything is correct. So that you make sure that you know, each item really has been through that approval process. Now you're probably gonna spend more time looking at these accounting procedures um, and the controls around accounting than the controls around the general lease process. So for example, when you need to add an asset to the fixed asset register, create the liability, there's going to probably need to be um, a process where you review a sample of documentation to add the asset, add the leased asset LA, and the least liability, all right? Because that's going to be a, there's going to be a lot of calculations in there. We're not going to redo the calculations, but was the documentation reviewed and approved before the asset? and the liability were created. All right, we're gonna get into the details more of leased asset and leased liabilities a little bit later on. So we wanna make sure that, you know, when you, oh, we've got a new leased asset. Oh, great, here is all the information we need. I've prepared the journal entries. Has somebody reviewed those before that they've been posted? Now, when it comes to the regular journals, again, we wanna find out uh, this might be an automated process or it might be a manual process. Now, if it's an automated posting process where things are automatically going out, you know, as soon as you make the bank payment, the journal entry occurs, then we need to look at the controls over that process. So who sets up the automated journal entries and approves for any manual journal? So they manually prepare the journal, then are proposed journals reviewed before posting? Now we also want to look at here, you know, the questions of segregation of duties. Who can do these tasks and then what can they do? So not everyone might have access to the fixed asset register and some people on the fixed asset register might only be able to create or view you might not be able to delete anything. So you want to check those roles and responsibilities as well when it comes to that segregation of duties component. Now, when it comes to substantive procedures, this is where it gets a little bit more complicated because with our substantive procedures, we have two components. The first one is that we have our leased asset and our lease liability. All right, and those are items that are going to be on the balance sheet. So they have balance assertions to worry about. The other thing to consider is that our consideration, our payments to the company that we're leasing from have to happen and we also need to record depreciation, which means that we're going to have to worry about the 
transaction assertions. So I'm going to split these up and I'm going to do them separately. Depreciation I'm not going to handle so much. You can look into my property plan and equipment video for ideas and on how you can test depreciation because the process works exactly the same. So let's start with the least assets and the least liabilities. And I'm going to firstly write down the assertions. Now I always recommend starting from the assertions and then building procedures off that. Don't build procedures and then go, oh, have I covered all the assertions? Because it's very likely that you're gonna miss something. So I always start from that assertions-based approach. So for existence, remember existence is we're gonna be vouching something, we we'll start with the records and go back to the original um, source of the transaction or the documentation. So here I'm going to, oops, Select a sample of my leased assets, LAs, from the fixed asset register, all right? And vouch, so, tra so go backwards, vouch to the physical asset. Okay, that's gonna tell me that there's an item, it really does exist. And also, match to the lease contract. Now, why do I want to go back and make sure that there's a contract? Because I want to make sure it's definitely a leased item and not an item that they own. So we want to make sure that there is um, that component. So normally, if I'm checking PPE, for example, I'm just vouching from the records back to the physical item, but I want to make sure that there's also that contract involved. Now, in terms of sample selection, when you're sampling, you could use haphazard, you could use block, you could use random, but you know, pick a specific sample method that suits your particular population in your test. Now, when it comes to thinking about which of these are probably most at risk, the assertions most at risk I'd be worried about is going to be that accuracy, completeness, and rights and obligations. Less so existence, but the other three, I think, in, in my perspective, are, are the things that we're more worried about the most. So with completeness, it's are we under-reporting? So usually we trace here. So we're going to select a sample of physical leased assets. I can just write LA there. I don't need to... LAs and trace, so move forward. So start from the physical item and follow it through to the lease contract and records in the fixed asset register. All right, we wanna make sure that leased asset, and how would you figure out which ones might be a leased asset when you're looking at um, the you know, assets in the building, your leased assets might have a separate color barcode or something else that would help us identify them. Now, the other thing about trying to potentially identify underreported leased assets might be to do some analysis of payments. So analyze payments for lease exemptions. Now, there are two areas in which you may have an exemption for a lease. And that is an asset that is going to be leased for less than 12 months, we just have an expense, or an asset that is low value when you first bought it, but you're still leasing it. So like you're leasing something that's maybe $200, that's low value, you can just include, you don't have to worry about recording the leased asset. So we might wanna analyze payments for lease exemptions and uh, review the contracts, the lease contracts. to make sure it is an exempt item and should not be recorded. Because, and this is where, you know, we sort of have some crossover with rights and obligations. You might have something that is low value, that you might, you know, this, your entity or the client that you're auditing says, this is low value, um, but, in your perspective, you have to look at that and say, well, is it really low value? You're leasing it for five years. Uh, there's decent residual value at the end. So you need to go through those exemptions and make sure that none of them should actually be leased assets. So that's one thing to do there. Now, accuracy valuation and allocation is gonna be really complicated. Um, the accuracy side, that accuracy part is really about your depreciation and accumulated depreciation. Now, if you see me write DP apostrophe N or DPN, that's depreciation. 
So you can look at my property plant and equipment video for the stuff about accuracy. But valuation is where it really becomes complicated. Because remember, you've got your liability, your lease liability, and you've got the leased asset. Now the lease liability is the present value of the future payments using the interest rate from the contract or some sort of other rate that implies, you know, a rate of borrowing or something. Um, so you have to figure out that present value. Now the client might use software to do this where they put the payment in. Uh, you have to be careful if the payment increases over time. So if there's a CPI increase component in there to recalculate the, the present value. So that's the present value, which means that one of the things that you might need to do here because it's the present value is to recalculate. So what you're gonna do here is recalculate the present value of the future payments and then reconcile to the value recorded in the accounts. All right, so you wanna make sure that that lease liability is there. Now, when it comes to the leased asset, leased asset, I'll write the full thing there. That's where, again, more complication because the leased asset value is the lease liability plus any initial sort of setup costs plus any cost to dismantle or remove the asset at the end. So that's the value of the leased asset. So to be able to actually audit that, again, we're gonna to need to recalculate the LA, leased asset value, using the contract, all right, because that'll have all the important information and reconcile that, reconcile to the fixed asset register, okay? And, and that's where it's going to need to be really important. You're also going to need to uh, check accumulated depreciation is being recorded appropriately. But you're gonna get that from when you're uh, auditing the, the PPE depreciation side of things, okay? So we've covered valuation. Now the other thing we need to think about is allocation. And remember, that is because most of these things should be in the non-current category. So your leased assets are likely to be non-current assets because if it was a current asset, then it's not really worth leasing. So they should be non-current assets and then also non-current liability. So you've got the asset side and you've also got the liability side. And this is where it gets tricky because the liability is broken into what you owe into the future and then what you owe into the next 12 months. The next 12 months actually should be recorded as a current liability and then anything after 12 months should be a non-current liability. So you need to um, inspect the records and look at what's on that balance sheet to make sure that they're apportioned and allocated correctly. And then we have rights and obligations. Now remember, right to recognize the asset, obligation to recognize the liability. So again, here, we're gonna be reviewing lease contracts. And we're going to be looking for information about do we control the asset? Do we receive benefits? And also, do we have responsibilities? All right, so we're making sure that this really is you know, a proper lease and that we have our obligations and our rights in there. Uh, remember earlier, I mentioned uh, a little bit further up that when we're looking at completeness, you know, if we have some smaller leased items that are exempt, again, we wanna make sure that they're properly exempt. So remember that IFRS 16 cut out the distinction between financial and operating leases. They're all just financial leases now unless they meet those two exemptions. Uh, so we need to make sure that companies aren't trying to record items just as operating leases when they really should be financing leases. So we really need to go back and look at that. And this was important because when we saw IFRA 16 or AASB 116 come in in Australia, I think there was, I read an estimate somewhere that like $100 billion worth of assets and liabilities were added to balance sheets, which again, threw off a lot of ratios for a lot of firms. So that is leased assets and the leased liability side. Now, 
we need to go on to um, the other side, which is going to be about the depreciation uh, and the payments. Now, remember I mentioned before, I'm not gonna go too much into the depreciation section, but I am gonna talk about here the payment side. All right, so in terms of our assertions, of, of course, I'm gonna start by writing them out. All right, so again, this is no different than any other accounts payable. Uh, I haven't put that in my video series yet, but it's coming. So we're going to do things like vouch a random sample of lease payment journals to, now they might invoice you if there's a lot, to invoices or contracts, all right? So proof that you know we really do have an arrangement to make these payments to the suppliers. Because remember, when you make a, a payment, you're gonna go debit uh, your lease expense, credit cash. Okay, so we wanna select a sample of those. So that's the occurrence part. Did it really happen? Was there a payment? Um, to invoices or contracts, and also proof of the funds transfer. I'm going to assume here that we have elec electronic funds transfer. We're not actually sending physical checks. We just don't do that here in Australia. You might do that in some other countries, but <laughs> hopefully everybody's moving to electronic banking at the moment. Um, not a great idea to be handling lots of things. Now completeness is have we recorded all of our payments? So again, we're worried about under-reporting. So if we're picking things to be at risk, completeness and accuracy there is gonna be the under-reporting issues that we need to think about. So here we're gonna trace a sample, maybe let's say a haphazard sample this time. Uh, neither is better than the other, really. Haphazard sample uh, of lease contracts to funds transfer and journal entries. Again, so we had to make a payment, the payment was made, journal entry for the payment was made, trace it through time following our footsteps. Now remember accuracy is all about the dollars. So while tracing and vouching, and we should do this either way, right? Because we take attack the, the transactions from both ends. While tracing and vouching, uh, match the payment to the journal entry. Uh, oh, hang on, maybe match the amount of the payment to the journal entry. So again, dollar value is correct. Um, we might also potentially recalculate the payment. So if there is some sort of formula about how the repayment is calculated, you might recalculate it, do the formula again yourself to make sure that that amount um, is correct. Uh, match the amount to the journal of the payment to journal entry and the contract as well. We want to make sure that we're paying the amount on the contract. That might need to be indexed by CPI or something, but usually there's a table that says like, these periods, here's the payment, these periods, here is the payment. All right, classification. This is about, remember, journal entries. The journal's being recorded correctly. So while tracing, check that the journal entry uses the correct account code from the chart of accounts. And sometimes you might see chart of accounts as COA. So remember COA is the full list of every single account code. Um, and you know, every leased asset you have will have its own account code. So we're making sure those journal entries are, doing, are, are being done correctly. Now we have to do that while we're tracing, while we're moving forwards. Because if I start with vouching, I'm never going to find incorrect journal entries because I'm always looking in where they should be and we're not looking where they shouldn't be. All right, cutoff. Cutoff is about recording things in the correct period. So here, uh, let's uh, select a block sample. 
of payments, let's say two weeks, two weeks before and after the end of the financial year, okay? Um, ensure that the journal entry is recorded in the same period that the payment is made. Oops, the payment is made. Now that is really important because if you pay on the 30th of June, then you want it to be recorded in the 30th of June and not in the future period. Now the other thing that we haven't talked about yet is the presentation assertion, which is really all about the disclosures there. So that's about our note disclosures and making sure that our note disclosures are in line with IFRS 16, or if you're in Australia, AASB 116. Um, so we're gonna need to review those notes, check the standard and make sure that what the standard says they're supposed to do is actually what they've done. So you're gonna do a lot of inspecting and checking there. Now, of course, if you get stuck on this and you go, oh, I'm not sure if they're disclosing the right information, go and talk to an expert within your firm. There'll be somebody who specializes in uh, reporting of leases, for example, or there'll be an IFRA 16 specialist that you can ask to say, look, does this look right? Are they doing this correctly? Phew, all right, so that is everything in our procedures for testing controls and substantive testing, but it's not exhaustive. So if you have an idea on how we could test substantively or a control for leases, the liability, the payment, um, the asset, then definitely please share those with our little audit community. We're growing and growing uh, every single week in the comments. Of course, if you haven't already, I'd love for you to subscribe. I have lots of new videos coming out every single week. Um, and also I'm on all of the socials. So you can follow me on Instagram, on Facebook, uh, on Twitter as well. Um, but thanks for watching. Stay safe, stay well, and I'll see you next time.